really excited to bring to you guys this hot seat. Uh, as many of you guys know, every month we interview one of our clients who's uh, kicking some goals and uh, making some strides in their business. We've had some incredible guests on so far. Uh, Jack, Dan Peterson, uh, Vicky, you were on as well just recently. And today we're lucky enough to have Harmy uh, all the way from country Melbourne, out near Geelong. Where are you calling in from today, Harmy? Uh, yeah, we're Geelong. Warm ponds in Geelong. Warm ponds. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you say warm ponds? Warm ponds, that's what it's called. Oh, warm ponds, not warm ponds. Okay. But that's, okay. that's not country Melbourne either. Your, your city, Geelong. City, <laughs> city, Geelong. Metro, Geelong. Oh, it's already started. Looks like you guys might be in for a cheap comedy show today as well, <laughs> but that's okay. So, Harmony, look, for the members out there that haven't, had, haven't been lucky enough uh, to meet you so far, one of the intensives, you are coming to the next one. Um, yes. So make sure you guys get your tickets now. I think we've had 55, maybe 60 people register, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a fantastic event. Harmi, do you want to just tell them a little bit about you, uh, what it is that you do, and your business, and then we'll then I'll kind of shift and shake things around a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, we uh, I'm a I'm an educated concreter. So I went through high school and university, uh, completed those was really sports oriented as a kid, um, applied to move into sports coaching and sports psychology, um, and then got drafted to an AFL club at that time and um, following that, that line. Uh, got involved in personal training as a sort of side thing to what I was doing and did that for a few years. But as I started to get more involved in coaching sport, stepped away from um, personal training. And, and one, of the guys, one of the guys that I used to uh, play football with, he had a concreting company, which is a big concrete company now. Um, but that's how I started. Got into concreting, did it for a couple of years, went and did my um, carpentry apprenticeship and then met my wife, bought a house, kids and start, got decided that, Concreting was probably the best cash vehicle for me to sort of achieve the things that we wanted to in our life. Yeah. And that's Fantastic. the story. So, Fantastic. So now, yeah. So now, the, now we're sort of, um, you know, we've had our challenges in our business. Like we grew really quickly early just through reaching out to contacts from my sporting background. Um, and then let, 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 Let's go back to that in a second, I guess. Um, so not your normal concreter. You didn't start off uh, or even leave school uh, feeling or thinking you were going to go into a concreting apprenticeship. No. Uh, obviously, went and, went and tried, your, tried your luck at a few other things. Uh, there was some curiosity around someone that you knew at the time that's now got quite a large concreting business. But essentially, after you met your wife, had some kids, you felt that concreting was probably the best long-term cash vehicle um, for where you wanted to go. Yes. Now, now I'd love to dive into, like, we were l- lucky enough to catch up uh, probably a month ago now, maybe, uh, down your way and yes. do, a bit of, to do a bit of filming about your story. And I actually watched the first cuts the other day. And there's a couple of interesting things around there that I think is really key to share with the guys. And I guess, can we take it back? I want to go through kind of where I'd like to play is go through kind of step by step the last couple of years up until, up until you meeting us. Then yeah. kind of this last... Um, maybe nearly 12 months now, eight or nine months it's possibly been, yep. um, what, what's kind of changed and what's happened. And then I want to kind of dive down a little bit into more so the psychology and the strategies that you've specifically put in place the last eight months that have seen you kind of pretty much step right back out of, of operation to the business, which is where you were stuck only eight or nine months ago. Yes. Be- before we do that, let's talk a little bit about like, so you went into concreting, um, grew massively fast to multiple millions of dollars. And then everything kind of fell apart. Let's talk about that, that bit of a journey of where you first started in concreting. Yeah, so um, in the early stages of our business, the, the really important thing for me, just, and I, I don't know, it was just something that I thought, but my interest was to, I, I was always involved in team sports. So yeah. um, having a team and working with a team was always what I, what I wanted to do. So the first instinct was to, I had smaller scale clients, but try and find someone when I really needed work, I could reach out to them and I could get it. So not a volume builder, but sort of mid-volume builder. Um, And that allowed me to have consistent employees from the beginning. Um, But, yeah, look, our first year turnover was about a half a million dollars. And then year two was about 1.1. 
Um, and then year three was just maybe a little bit more. And then as we went into year four, it was, you know, we did two million in the first six months. Yeah. And, um, but I was running every bit of that out of my head. We had 25, we had 25 guys and it was literally out of control. Yeah. And, and let's talk about how, like, how do you feel that you grew so fast? Because even though, even though there was quite some big lessons and some challenges and, and in many ways you could almost see even some failures in, in, in that explosion and then what, what happened afterwards, yep. you did do a lot of things right to grow that quickly, right? There was a lot of things that were done right. Like you guys haven't even got a website. To date, you still haven't got a website up <laughs> online, right? <laughs> we, were talking, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. I, I was going down to this interview with Harmi and I couldn't even find anywhere online where the guy actually lived. There was like no registered address for you guys <laughs> anywhere, no website, nothing. Um, we, do have a lot of, we, we do have a lot of people who have, who've eventually get in contact with us. Who... <laughs> eventually. It's like, oh, I've been trying to find you for six months. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what do you think you guys did well? Like you didn't really have a business background. What do you think, that you, looking back now and knowing what you know now with, with hindsight, what do you think you did well in the beginning to have grown that fast? Uh did what I said I was going to do. Tell us more. Strictly. So, um, you know, what, for me, when, when it's a mission involved, you know, and I tell someone that's going to be done, really important for me. It's really important for me to not let that client down and make sure that that job gets done, for yeah. one. Um, but secondly, uh, it was the quality aspect of our job was really critical. So... Um, I don't like to do th- A, I don't like to do things twice mm. B, I don't like other- to tell other people to do things twice so it's really important that we have sort of steps to get everything done properly and then when we get execute those steps to make sure that at the completion of that one we check it for the quality aspect before we move on to the next <coughs> one mm. It's really interesting because I, as many of you guys know, I had a trades business as well. I had a kitchen uh, manufacturing company and we grew to 2.2 million in about three, three and a half years. And we, although we had a website, we never advertised, like we never spent any money on marketing at all. And I honestly believe that one of the key things that allowed us to grow as fast as we did uh, was the word of mouth marketing because I was so fanatical and so pedantic about how we left our jobs, which is similar to you, Harmi. And this is the thing, like for any of you guys that are watching this right now that are in a trades business, typically tradies have a bad name. Typically tradies have a bad name for not finishing things off properly or leaving things half done or doing a half assed job. And I think it's not always going to be that way, but I think there's still a huge opportunity right now if you're a tradie, but if you just do an incredible job and, and leave the job like well, well done, your business will grow quickly, not immediately but it will, will start to ramp up, as you've seen, Harvey. You know, it went from half a million bucks to, to 2.5 in only a couple of years. Absolutely. And I think the, the critical thing is just to <clears throat> take away the pain of complaint from the client. Like, if you take away any opportunity for them to complain, yeah. it's, a, it's a much smoother ride. Yeah. And it's not like, like, no disrespect, but it's not like you guys are doing fine joinery. Like, you're laying concrete slabs. Yeah. Right. It, it's not like you're doing that fine internal stuff that people look at all the time. Yet, people still want things to be done right. They want to know that their that their hard earned money that they're spending is is being put into a product or a service. If you're a service business as well, watching this too, that is going to last the test of time. It's going to deliver them above and beyond their expectations. Yeah. And I think the um, that there, I think with with ours, because the impact of our job, if it's not done well. It, goes all the way up the chain, you know. The <clears throat> chippies then have problems, the roofers then have problems. So it's really critical that our job is, you know, we do a good job of it and yeah. it's, our industry is, it's a really tough one. It's really poorly, it's really poorly regulated and unless people are going to put their hand up and do something different about it, that's going to, the next generation is a really challenging place, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So in those beginning few years, you felt that um, just doing a really good job was one of the key things that allowed you to grow so fast. Was there anything else that you felt you guys did well, looking back now? I think, communica- I think communicating with <clears throat> like our communication with the clients. Look, if the client was ringing or, or we had a job or whatever it might be, the critical pathway was just to ensure that if, if things weren't on track, you weren't ignoring their telephone calls. You were yeah. sort of 
front foot and letting them know that you weren't on track or you were letting them know that you were. Yeah. 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 That, I think that getting the job done really well, making sure they're well informed, they were the two critical factors. Yeah, taking a proactive approach. I remember for us, like, we went through a period where we got into a lot of debt. Uh, we just grew way too fast. And when you're in a trades business or a business like that where you're, you know, the faster you grow, the more supplies you need to buy and the more labour you need to pay. And often you, you've paid out for your supplies before you even get paid completion for the job. Yeah. And so you're always carrying this debt. And if you grow too fast, you can grow broke. And we went through a phase of growing incredibly fast and got into a lot of debt. And I remember the, one of the biggest things that got us through that is the fact that we would call all of the suppliers sometimes daily just to, to tell them that there was no update. There was, it wasn't even an update. But us reaching out to them took a proactive approach, which allowed them to be more comfortable with where we're at and what was happening and actually allowed them to, to offer more help for us than, than a lot of people that I've met or that I know that sit back and just ignore those phone calls. Yeah. You know, so, so that relationship building, that communication, I think for any business, <clears throat> you know, whether you're in a trades business or not, is, is key is to keep that approach, approach and communication. Like people obviously don't want things to run late. But if they're, if, they're, if they're warned ahead of time or if they're, they're communicated with ahead of time, they're far more okay with it than if you allow them to chase you. Especially if you're trying. I mean, unforeseen circumstances, they are what they are. But, yeah. No, you're right. Suppliers or clients, if you, if you avoid the conversation, that causes more tension because yeah. no one knows what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's the doubt and there's the uncertainty in their mind. It's like at least if you ring them with no update or a update, there's some form of certainty in your communication with them. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk about now what happened. Like you guys grew massively quick. What happened uh, after that point? Where, where did the wheels start to fall off? Let's talk about that a bit. Uh, so in our excitement of how well we were going, even though I, I was working from... 3.30 in the morning till about 12.30 or 1 o'clock at night. That's what it was like. And it was like that for uh, for a block there, I would have done that for 60 days, I reckon. So working on site. Wow. Working, working, going to Melbourne, working jobs there, and then going doing afternoon shift to about 11.30, then getting home, going to bed. And didn't see my family for a while. Um, but in, in hindsight, that work actually saved us when we uh but we just our excitement meant that we made bad decisions and didn't follow up on our due diligence in terms of assessing our clients and their them qualifying to our need for payment yeah whether they were viable clients yeah. so um yeah like we uh two hundred thousand dollars worth of billing we just didn't see and that was yeah. sort of leading in that was <clears throat> When we bought our new bought our new property on the farm, so we could bring the business here and um, going into Christmas, so we went from twenty five blokes to three. Wow! <clears throat> so you guys grew from from one to twenty five in what three years or something? Yep. And then from twenty five back down to three, seemingly overnight. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, overnight yep. from yep. before Christmas to after Christmas. Yeah, yep. which is which is which is huge. Like businesses, I do believe that growing business, uh, there is expansion and contraction. There is, there's always expansion and contraction. It's like a heartbeat. You know, the way that the heart pumps blood around our body is through expansion and contraction and business is no different. There is this expansion and contraction, but that's, that's like, that's deathly contraction. Well, that's how it was. I mean, we could have easily put our hand up for bankruptcy. You know, fortunately, uh, uh, we had money to cover some supplies, which meant, we were able to keep moving, but most of our other clients and suppliers, we communicated the situation. And I mean, we've been working with them for three years, and we never had issues with paying. Yeah. So <clears throat> being able to communicate with them to say, "Look, this is our this is our debt this is our debt clearance plan," um, and we traded our way through. It took yeah. us five or six, five years, maybe six years to clear all of it. Yeah. But yeah. So what were some of the lessons that, that were learned during that period? Because that, that can uh, kind of scald your confidence and, you know, create a bit of risk aversion as well going through something like that. So what were some of the lessons that you learned through that contraction per se? Um, I think the really critical one, the really critical lesson we learned at that time was 
really around payment terms and our legally binding our, our contracts yeah. uh, and how tight our contracts were in terms of liability and protection. Yeah. Uh, our due diligence procedures, making sure that, you know, whether we, if it's a new client, if we're going to do jobs for them, how much as we, we build them up front and how long we do that for until they be, we build enough of a relationship to trust trust them as a client. Yeah. Um, but I think, for, like, we were not prepared for that. Not one yeah. bit. Like, my wife and I, we, me in particular, because I felt heavily responsible for that. Yeah. Um, and that was, re- it was really tough. It was really tough. You know, at the state, when it happened, we thought we are going to, I thought potentially we could lose everything and that's just where our mindset was, was at. So, I was fortunate enough to... Re- you're the provider, right? You know, like you've taken on board that role as, as the provider and the protector of your family. And yeah. of, of course, you're going to take on board the guilt or the shame or the, the negative emotion around that situation in, in many ways, even blaming yourself that you should have known better. Yeah. And even in the next month, 12 months after that, it was, you know, there was just days where I'd say to my wife, this can all go and get stuffed. Yeah. Like, because it feels very hollow. Like our debt... From a debt perspective, we were, we were sort of we were paying back about between nine and ten grand a month in debt. Yeah, about business, like it was, um, and it was weight bearing. Yeah, to well, you're you, you spinning you know, wheels, not moving ahead. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we weren't ready for that. If I was, you know, if there's anything that I I would recommend for anyone to take out of it is just be prepared to emotionally cope with bad debts. Decisions, yeah. yeah. It's bad decisions and bad debts. Yeah. And especially I, if they're going to be good ones. I, I think there's a few key things there too. Like there's a couple of things. No, number one is uh, I think a lot of people get into business and they don't put any of their time into that legal aspect or even their financial side of things. It's like all their time goes into sales and marketing or hiring staff because it's like there's this kind of egoic thing around how many staff have you got right as opposed to actually protecting themselves and especially the tradies like you should be taking 50 percent deposit minimum up front yeah. you know if, if you're actually putting your money across the line to buy product materials and that's anyone really if you're doing any custom work whether it's signage and stuff like that you should be taking a 50 percent deposit up front uh and some sort of progress payment and completion i think the other thing too is i think that it's our responsibility as business owners to get to the position as quickly as possible where we have three months with a bank in, a, in the bank accounts we have yeah. three months' worth of expenses covered. If shit hits the fan tomorrow and we stop winning work, we can pay everything for three months before, yeah. before we run out. And it, and, it, and it is a big feat, especially when you're starting, but that's where the profit first methodology comes in as well, is that regardless, even yeah. if you're a startup business right now or if you're a business with very established bad habits, the profit first methodology within three to six months will see you have more money in your bank than what you've got right now. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's a key thing that I kind of see. And then secondly, like you said, Harmi, is that what a lot of people don't understand is that in America, the average millionaire has been bankrupt 2.3 times. Yeah. Like if you're, in, if you're in business, you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. You're going to stuff things up. You're going you're gonna to make bad judgments. But it's not, that's not to scold us or to stop us from, from leaning into the discomfort. Like the, the, if I look back, the biggest mistakes that I made in business have been the biggest, not just business in life itself, have been the biggest learnings for me that have shaped my company or that have shaped the direction of my life. Yeah. And I think what stops people is they make a bad decision and then stop making decisions because they don't want to make another bad one. Whereas yeah. like no decision is worse than a decision. And it's just a matter of managing that risk as well. Like if, if making that decision, I remember Richard Branson said, he got interviewed once and someone said, oh, well, like, you know, you've, you've got a lot of luck. And he said, I'm not lucky at all. I said, well, you have to have been to, to create what you've done. He said, well, no. I just asked myself two questions before I make a decision. He said, the first question is, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that could happen? And the second question is, if that was to happen, could I handle it? Now, if you ask yourself that question and it's like, oh, I could go bankrupt, probably think for a little bit longer before making that decision. Whereas if that decision is like, oh, I might lose 5K, I might lose 10K, jump into it. If the upside is potential of making 50, of it making 100K. Because yeah. we're, always, we're always playing on that edge of risk in business. Like, and, and if we're not... We're we're going to get we're going to get stomped over because we're we're not innovating we're not we're not moving ahead. 
So how have you allowed that then to change the way that you make decisions now? Um, You're writing that down. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm sending the wife an email so she can um, to grab me a bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, I've got a bit of bronchitis and my throat is drying. All right. <laughs> I'm a bit of sandpaper. Um, I think um, I think it's interesting now because after that, now I'm more able to uh, define what it is that I learned from it. But mm. I think the um, one of the really big things that because right then, at that time, bankruptcy or the financial impact was the thing that I was really concerned about. Yeah. That was the thing that really struck me. But now, a real bankruptcy and those sort of things, it doesn't really, it, it concerns me, but that it might happen or yeah. may happen, yeah. but I'm not afraid for that to happen that I don't think I can That's right. move on behind that. Look, I, right. I have no doubt that you know, I can, I could lose everything, and tomorrow I could be doing the same thing and going bigger, and bigger, and better from the lesson. I think no, that's no, yeah. No, no one can ever take away from us the lessons that we've learned, and and that's a beautiful thing. I, I'm the same. Like I'm, I'm, I'm less risk averse now than what I used to be. Thanks, darling. I'm less <laughs> risk, I'm less risk averse now than what I used to be. But having said that. Um, the, the potential cost of those risks is far greater now as well. There's a lot more to lose now than yeah. what there was five years ago. However, I, I know that everything that I've learned, if I was to lose everything tomorrow, I could start back up the next day and still make a million bucks in the first year. Absolutely. Right? Because, because, because once you've learned those skill sets of running a business right, successfully, you don't, you don't lose and no one can take them away from you. And what I mean successfully is you can run a successful business and still make a stupid decision or still have something from your past to come back and haunt you. And I think, honestly, out of everyone that I speak to, prospective clients, clients, I think the number one thing that most people don't have a handle on is their finances. Yep. Right? And, and basic, basic financial management. Like, you don't need to know how to read your P&L or your balance sheet if you're following the profit first methodology because it's so damn simple to understand whether you're spending or underspending on, on yourself, on your expenses, on well, your supplies. I, I think my first eight years of financial management was – Spend less than I make. Yeah, that it was that simple. Like yeah. I was, I've got a really, I've got a really good brain and memory for numbers. So you know, I was always crunching profitability or you know the positive, the positive reach of each job. So yeah. I just never ever put myself in a position where we would fall behind unless we grew. And you know, the cash flow, then you have the cash flow issues. So yeah, and and obviously there's certain businesses that are more complex than other businesses um, as well. You got to a pretty low point, though, after all this army. Like, you were, you'd kind of hit rock bottom. You are pretty down out on yourself, like, had this debt over your head, a lot of emotional stuff. You were pretty burnt out from doing such long hours yes. for so long that when you stopped and the adrenaline kind of wore off, you were in a pretty dark place. And there was a couple of things that were a, a sign significant shift for you. One was the Coda Trail, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Do, you want, do you want to tell the guys about that? Well, interestingly enough, the, I think you're, I did Kokoda in 2018. Yeah. July, late July, July 2018. But it was in two, the end of 2017 where, uh, you know, obviously I, talk, I was talking to my wife and I was just struggling with the business and, you know, I think it, in mid-40s mid thinking, is this all it's going to be? You know, when you're, you're grinding it all the time and, you know, you're up at five and finishing at 10 or 11 or whatever it is, however late it is, and, you know, your kids are growing up and trying to be there for them and balance all of the challenges and responsibility that you feel you have and the guilt around not being able to fulfil fulfill it. Yeah. Um, I think the, the conversation came up pre-Christmas, uh, May pre-Christmas in 2017, and uh, my wife brought me... But the really big thing for me in my whole life was sport and physical, like physical, you know, physical, activities. Yeah, that's right. Like the transit kind of concreting for me was an amazing one because I went from doing all physical training for my sport, three or four hours a day or whatever it was, to coming into 
a, a job where it was easy for me to transition and I could shine above everyone else because mm. it was just something that I wanted to do. You know, I went and did carpentry. It was just a real struggle because I didn't feel like the workload was enough for me. And I still feel like that. These young blokes these days, I can still run ringers around them. But, <laughs> but um, in that Christmas, uh, you know, we talk a lot about reinvesting in that physical aspect of our lives around everything else. And, and my wife bought me a trip to Kokoda. Mm. So the life-changing moment was her decision to do that. Yeah. Um, and that really um, forced forced me to be consistent in um, working out to be prepared and capable for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a significant moment because that started to shift you mentally. Yes. You know, from, from where you were. It brought about that fire back in your belly. And I think it was shortly after that that you got back that you came across us. Well, I think what happened was is I think because uh, my connection with Jack, Jack Chalice, so yeah. obviously um, Jack and I work on a lot of projects um, of the same address and, you know, I've spoken to Jack a lot and we sort of, we definitely, our values and everything that we are align quite significantly. So I think, you know, he was talking about, business coaching, and I'd been thinking about it for years and years um, and it just just had sort of hesitated from a financial perspective, which was crazy, but it was just that. I think it was just that cautious step, you know. Based on everything that happened, of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he actually rang me while I was on the Kokoda trip. So I had one wow. where I had a point... Um, where we had, we had service, which was like totally one hour of the whole trip, um, he got through to me. And, wow. and he said that I think they'd been re- you guys have been re- reaching out for referrals and he asked me if, I was inter- if he could give, me, give him my number. And I yeah. said, yeah, just do it, yeah. Yeah. And so an hour of the whole entire Coded Ale trip, it was a few days, Jack yep. got through to you, connected us, and then obviously we got on a call. We got on a call with one of us um, when you got back yep. from Kokoda yep. and joined up into business. And back then, um, there was only a few employees. You had a, a half a team. You were doing all the estimating yourself. You were doing all the project management side of things yourself. Just everything. You were, like- you were, still, you were, you were still on the barra. <laughs> um, and, you know, you guys had obviously taken a massive hit from revenue perspective back then. Yeah. It's sort of the reality of the story is is that we had that massive hit in 2011 and genuinely between 2011 like 2012 can't even remember it really like it's a blank um 2013 14 15 16 they're all just you know 17 they're all just about being safe yeah so what it was just about being safe being at a, a size that was manageable um, without sort of stretching me too far, let, just enough to let the guys do um, what they needed to do. And if I needed to step away a bit, I could. Yeah. Yeah. The ceiling falling in, mate. Yeah. But there was a significant mindset block there, right? Because he, here's the thing, right? <coughs> Human beings will do more than protect something than to create something. They'll do more to protect a million bucks than they will to go out and create a million bucks. It's, it's a known, known scientific proven fact and so after you nearly losing everything you're exerting any any little effort and energy you had left into just protecting what was left yeah right which put you into a significant holding pattern for many years yeah yeah right um obviously came along we met face to face in december last year actually it was yeah. I'll, I'll never forget december, december october 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 intensity oh in Perth. no you're right october it was october last year in yeah. Perth. Yeah. And uh, let's talk a little bit about from then to now because you've made some significant strides and some significant lead forwards. Like we talked about back then, you were still doing everything. You had one team. Let's talk a little bit about like, like where were you then to where you are now and then we'll kind of dive into the, the things that you've implemented and put in place along the way. Um, so where I was then and where I am now? <clears throat> yeah. Well, at that point in time... <laughs> 
look, I think we're probably, from a turnover perspective, we're, we're sort of pretty consistently, I don't know, maybe 1.3 to 1.6, somewhere around there, generally probably to the lower end. Yeah. Uh, uh, and doing that pretty comfortably, doing it really comfortably. Um, now, uh, the last financial year, I think we turned over about, I think we turned over between 2.4 and 2.5. Um, and that was, probably didn't bill about 300 grand a work or 200 grand a work. So, um, you know, and I think back then, again, I was doing all the work plus my wife who was doing a bit of stuff in terms of all plan, getting plans and stuff together that we needed. Um, and that was pretty, it was tough times. You know, it was a lot of work, but I think with the game changes, uh, coming across an intensive, um, and not only that, but working with Michael and just doing a few things where we were defining what were the critical, you know, what were the critical factors that we need to focus on. Um, but now, you know, we've got Anita who's in behind the scenes making sure that all our processes and systems are, you know, being executed uh, properly. So all my ideas, I'm a great ideas person, but getting it finalised and to the finish line, that's not necessarily my strength. I get excited by what's out in front, not necessarily about what's right here and now, unless it's collision sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah I think and then yeah, in the last month we've put on an estimator <clears throat> which and that was that was a huge volume of my time massive week, huge volume of my time a week yeah um, and then obviously my wife's still working in it so we've got we've got a fairly um, the estimators he's 24 to 30 hours a week yeah Wife's about, she's probably about the same, and Anita's about the same, and then we've got a bookkeeper who does about sixteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So essentially, in the last nine or ten months, you've you've added about one point three mil yep. to your turnover, give or take. Yep. Um, but the key thing that I see here is that you've actually relinquished control over the office admin management side of things to where you're no longer scheduling jobs like you can see behind you that scheduling board that Anita's beautifully keeps up to date in well, sync with um, Asana. That job there is one that we still work with so the great thing at the moment is scheduling I still work with but actually we run it through Asana so I get it on the board Anita puts it through Asana and then our daily tasks are our daily tasks are computerized so we can just go on Asana and we can look at the day we can go through our list and we just tick off what needs to be done. Yeah. You know, and then at the end of the day, we can do a quick cross-reference check to make sure there hasn't been any changes in, you know, the schedule is ahead or behind and whether yeah. we can do anything differently. Yeah. That's been a massive weight, though, because that was the weight of everything. Of course. Until I got that, that, that was you operationally, the octopus having to, to run everything. The brain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was coming out of here. Yeah. And now you've also got Tom on who's doing the estimating, which you said was a huge amount of your time prior doing that side of things. Absolutely. Um, and you've also built a second team. Is that right? There's a second team you've got? Uh, I've probably got a bit more than that. You know, I think now we've got 12 or, 13, 12 or 13 site workers. So we've really got uh, two fully functioning teams plus one in, that works in front of that. Yeah. 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 So you, you kind of tripled your team. You've relinquished all of those roles. What I want to know is... is something that I see most people struggle with is that when they make that transition that you've made in the past, you know, nine, 10 months, there's a significant blocker that often comes up internally because they go from being uh, very much identified with who they are in the business and, and being this juggler of so many balls yeah. to then kind of stepping right out of that. Can you share a little bit like what was your own personal journey and what were some of the kind of some of the voices or some of the beliefs that you had and you've had to deal with through relinquishing that responsibility through to Anita, through to Tom, and through to the, uh, your, your, your other teams as well? Well, I think the, um, you know, with Anita and Tan in the office, you know, that one still, as they start to learn and understand, I still play a bit of a role in that game. Not a massive one, but the really critical thing for me is if I schedule three weeks in front, then it's all, it's all done. So to give you a bit of an example, we've got a, we've got a few new employees at the moment. 
right? And we've got a lot of young guys who've been here with us for a while. Um, we've had three employees who were longer term experience who moved back to country Victoria and stuff like that. So the young guys find it really difficult to stand up for our values and be leaders. So the new guys who've come in who are a bit older, it's been really challenging. So I've actually, from uh, since since you were here, I think I've probably been on site seventy five percent of the time just to help guide and start helping the team. Uh, has started helping the team to understand each other, how to work more cohesively on site, what roles mm. they've got to play, just so they get it. Because when they come from somewhere else, there's such a vast difference from coming from somewhere else in our industry to how we operate. Mm. So, so you feel your, your role shifted more to from kind of management and being with the technician before on the tools doing the do to now being more of a leader and really kind of like the values are kind of paramount values and team cohesion absolutely yeah absolutely yeah there's a there's a lot of things that we're doing at the moment that uh that we're sort of proactively trying to do with our team we're sort of trying to create um a bit more of team awareness mm. so we're doing some things at the moment with um with our guys sort of doing having to make calls to other employees to talk about things that aren't work-related, just so they become a bit more aware of um, their t- team members and what they're like and how they operate, and just so we build that bit more of a sense of team. Mm. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think that's the... Um, that's and, and although we have, we've had little, you know, little things that haven't worked as efficiently as we want them to or things the way we've booked things in and um, there's been oversights. I mean, it's been pretty good. Like, things are pretty good. You know, there's yeah. rejigs and stuff like that. But yeah. you know, we're, we're at a point where my time in the office is becoming much less required um, and, um, and everyone's starting to sort of fulfil the need of the tasks that they need to do. Yeah, yeah. And if you look back at how the business is operating before with the 25 employees you had to your team now, what would you notice, what would you say the difference between the team dynamics and the cultures now? Like I know that you are going through and hiring now and, and kind of building that capacity. Yeah. What would you say you notice in the difference of the team? Um, I think now, this, although the roles are not super clear and super defined, but we're working there. So yeah. getting there progressively. Back then it was just like, right, you guys go there, you guys go there, you guys go there, you guys go there. Get that job done and I'll run from every job to make sure yeah. it's done properly. That's what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, so just building, building that leadership management, working with the right people to make sure the jobs are, are being done as per our values and how they, we need them, what they, we need them to stand for. Yeah, <laughs> but that'd be the main one. Not, yeah. not me drive, driving everything out of control. Was yeah. yeah. What it, what has been the impact of these shifts and changes on your on your wife and your kids? Um, like, have you I, noticed any changes? Look, I think um, prior to prior to maybe the last couple of months, where we're new hiring and it's just absorbed me back in a bit, just to give more time to. That process, I think, you know, certainly, well, even um, post work time, I've definitely, because I used to, I'd be working till eight o'clock every day, nine o'clock, mm. 10, 11. You know, these days, I don't, I don't really have that luxury. You know, our kids are heavily involved in sport. So, you know, <laughs> from four o'clock, from four o'clock onwards, you know, it's really important that I can give them time. It's, like I said, the last couple of months, it's probably not quite, quite been like that, but we just need to build a new workforce that stands for the values that we have. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, I think we're a couple of months away from that, but I'm pretty sure in a couple of months um, a, uh, it'll be a really, it'll be a really, we'll be back in a really strong place and the guys yeah. will be pretty clear about their understanding. We are in a strong place now, and I guess that's that's something that is important for all of us to do is never take for granted where you're at right now. You know, like wherever we're at right now, 
whatever our perceived challenges or our successes. At some point in life, you dreamed you'd be here or you would have liked to have been here, owning your own business, being in the position you are. And I, I think that we all have this dream that eventually we'll get there or the job will be done. And, and unfortunately, like your business is always broken. And the moment that you reach a place where you feel like your business isn't broken, that's probably when the biggest red flag comes up because you're about to get uh, struck down yeah, through, yeah, yeah. Through, through complacency. You know, like you guys are in an incredible position right now where you're at. And, you know, the most important thing is that you have that leverage of time now, Harmony, that you can become more that puppeteer over, over your team and over your staff and insert yourself where required. And I think that as a CEO, one of the core, I think there's kind of three things that, that we should be responsible for. And one of those three things is culture, yeah. is culture development and organisation because our, our, our organisation is a living and breathing organism that represents us as a business owner. Yeah. Right, it's our it's our, our our seat of creation that has created the business, and the culture needs to stand for what we stand for. So that if we're not never if we're not even there, the culture is still living and breathing as if we were, yeah. because it is it's a strand of that that DNA. Um, if you look back then, mate, like you've been in business for a while now, like what do you think of the three top learnings? Like if you look at everything you've learned, and you had to kind of shut down and, and start up shop again tomorrow, what are three things you take with you? What are the three kind of core learnings? That's a good question. <clears throat> I think setting your vision first, because I think once I got involved with TGC, I talked about vision and stuff for a long time. But machine, when I, after I came back from Kokoda, my vision shifted mm. massively, like really significantly. And um, I think the key learnings are make sure you protect yourself properly with a really clear plan, have your vision and be clear about it. Know, yeah, what's, yeah. You know what's your purpose, what's driving, what's driving you to do what you do. And it can't, it can't be just about money because money doesn't motivate. You know, there's got to be a bit more behind it. Money can motivate, but there's got to be a bit more behind it as well. Yeah. Um, money, money motivates you to a point where you're, you're living above average. Like, <coughs> you know, when, when we're still in that space, freedom when we're still in that, sorry? Freedom of choice is money. Yeah. You know, like if we're, if we're coming from a place of scarcity and like we're struggling to pay the bills and we've got debt, like money is a good motivator. But the moment that you get through or past that period or even to that line in the sand, if money's still your motivator, you'll, you'll start to feel incredibly lost until you create or find a vision inside of you far greater than what money can buy. Yeah. I think... I think at the moment, um, you know, developing a really good, develop a really good plan for managing your people, and mm. and a plan to retain how you retain them and treat them to retain them. Yeah. If I was to throw anything else in, like on for me now, right now, the really big change is starting to focus on the financials and how the pillars of our business drive those. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, Harmi, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And You're for welcome. the rest of you guys that have joined today, I'm going to get back to the wedding and the reception. Perfect, Perfect Barry. <laughs> and I'll be seeing you guys soon. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Harmi. See you, mate. Thanks. If you're in a position that many of our clients were before joining us, which is that your business is controlling you rather than you controlling your business, we would love to have a chat to you to see whether or not we might be the right fit to partner with you to help you grow and succeed in business. Over the past eight years, we've helped hundreds of business owners around the world to grow, scale and succeed in business. Uh, many of our clients report we've helped them to triple their profits and double their time off in 12 months or less. If you jump onto YouTube and notice the hundreds of testimonies, you'd see that this is a common theme amongst them. If you're a business owner that's generating more than $300,000 a year in annual revenue, uh, whether it's 500 million, five million, even $10 million a year, and you're looking to take your business and your life to the next level, we might be able to help. If you're noticing that your business is lacking structure, maybe systems or processes, maybe you're not quite attracting enough or, or the right type of quality leads, making enough sales, or maybe you've been having issues finding, hiring, retaining, and training the right team members, we could be a fit for you. Ultimately, we believe that we never have business problems, we have personal problems 
that are expressed through our business. And a lot of the work we do is with you as the business owner, helping you to constantly upgrade the way that you see life, the way that you make decisions, and the way that you help construct a profitable and purpose-driven business. In order for us to do that though, you need to book in a quick uh, 15 minute application call with one of our scaling specialists here at The Game Changers. Through that 15 minute call, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions to see if or how we might better help you. If we can't help you, we'll let you know politely and do our best to point in the direction of someone that can. However, if we can help you, we'll look at booking you an, a one hour game plan session where we're gonna dive a lot deeper into where you and your business are at right now, where it is that you want to go in the next three, five, and 10 years time, and what are the potential roadblocks or challenges or even opportunities that are along the journey in order for you to get there uh, faster. If you're really feeling that it's time for you to experience the love and the joy of running a business again, if you're really wanting to experience a business that does actually operate without you while still producing profit, uh, we may very well be the right fit. So book in a 15 minute call, we can have a chat and uh, see where we go from there. My name is Barry Baduti and uh, thanks for listening. Hopefully we get a chance to talk soon.